Hi, this is my review of Hard Light. Hard Light is a science fiction introductory adventure for the Stars Without Number role-playing game, but it's uh, quite deceptive. I thought it was just going to be a simple adventure, but it's uh, more than that, it's also a quite complete system to generate random space tombs. It also has the potential to develop into a mini campaign or even a long campaign. It's all up to you. Now let's talk about the quality of the PDF. Like many of my other old school adventures and role playing games and supplements, I actually printed this. Uh, but the PDF, the, the quality is pretty good. Uh, it's fully bookmarked, everything is uh, well organized and written. You have a few illustrations, not that many, just to give you like a sense of the theme and the plotline of the adventure. You can see a space tomb right there, it's kind of like that dome. And you see a ship going towards it. So the quality is excellent. As expected from any of, of Kevin Crawford's uh, adventures and games and supplements, the, the quality is just great. Now let's talk about the contents. Hard light. Oh, and be before we, we go further in, uh, this is going to have a lot of spoilers, so be mindful of that. The, the plot line is this. There is this uh, system uh, known as um, hard light, of course, and you have this uh, red giant star at the center of it. This star is known as the beast and it's constantly irradiating, uh, well, uh, heat, of course, as expected, but it's also um, a rich source of novium. So a station was built just behind a planetoid, uh, so that the station is protected by that planetoid from the powerful rays of the beast, but at the same time, it's at the right distance to deploy some drones and collect this novium. Now, this novium... Uh, this op uh, novium collecting operation uh, belongs to uh, the Tang family and the uh, Tang chairman had his, uh, her son in charge of things but this son was accused by the banks of embezzlement but he was actually framed by a guy named uh, Josh Dota so uh, Josh Dota um, framed the chairman's son and took control of Brightside of a station that's the name of the station, Brightside and um, However, some members of the Tang family uh, got really suspicious about his activities and even though they don't have enough evidence, they have made it uh, quite clear to Dota that if he ever leaves the station, they are going to kill him. So uh, Dota became sort of like king and prisoner of the station because he rules with an iron fist over the station, but at the same time he cannot leave that station or he's going to get killed. Mm, and things are starting to hit up uh, appropriate uh, with the setting because there is this guy named uh, Lomax and Lomax has a lot of evidence. He came upon that evidence somewhat accidentally, but he has enough material and evidence to uh, get uh, Dota in a lot of trouble even if he doesn't leave the station. So Lomax is constantly waiting for his chance to strike and take over the station and get Dota in jail or worse. So the characters arrive at this station with all of that happening, but there's also an element of mystery. The, uh, near the station, there were several objects, uh, floating structures uh, discovered, which are tombs, mysterious tombs that um, whose purpose are lost because they are quite ancient and they're also quite dangerous. Although some of those tombs could actually become um, bases or, or, or perhaps even hubs for the player characters. In, in fact, some space pirates have taken control of some of those tombs, but a part of the background of those tombs and the threats contained within is um, adds a lot of mystery and intrigue to the entire plotline. 
this adventure is highly detailed. You have uh, all the information regarding the uh, navigating uh, you know, within the station and around it, uh, all the uh, station systems, that is all the details and how the station works, uh, how life is being supported there. It's actually somewhat delicate in my opinion. So for example, if there's um, heavy combat uh, in, inside of the station, there's actually, uh, it's, a good probability that some of those life support systems will be damaged so this uh, requires a certain degree of, of finesse on the part of the player characters and you also have information on how to uh, the, the mining of the novium is carried out you have information on laws and regulations it's not allowed to carry weapons and armor uh, within the station so again the characters will have to be somewhat diplomatic if they want to move within the station and unravel all its secrets and you have information on, on life, on uh, how the um, workers within the station um, get uh, entertainment. Uh, it, it lists all the parks and theaters and the brothel within the station. You also have details on the personnel of Brightside and the details concerning the non-player characters. It's really well handled. You have a physical description for each of the Character, so they tell you, oh, this character, this is a young and dream woman with lapis lazuli eyes, a very dark skin, and slender hands scarred by her tools. Or um, this is a grizzled old system pilot with a squinty gaze and patches of melanoma on his face. And you have all the physical description and, and all their agendas and the hopes and wishes of each uh, character, uh, fears. They tell you this character is in love with this other character, or this character hates the gods of this other guy, etc. And the plans of the station are also highly detailed. You, ha you have the, um, the information on the low deck facilities, like um, the smelter, the station bridge, the pressure dock. You have information on mid deck facilities, such as the armory, the medical clinic. Uh, the locker, you have information on high deck facilities, hydroponic bay, the park plaza, the public restrooms. So all the information is right here and it's quite clear that there are uh, factions within the station because some of the non-player characters are on the side of Dota and some other characters are, are on the side of Lomax so um, some characters want to keep things as they are within the station but some others like uh, th those led by Lomax uh, actually want to start a sort of like a revolution within the, the station so uh, things really they, you constantly get that sense of things uh, heating up and because this is sort of like a slightly sandbox type of adventure, if the player characters don't um, interact with the non-player characters, things are going to keep moving and things may escalate to the point that the station is in danger. You have details on radiation poisoning, radio blackouts, uh, ship scanning and detection. And this adventure is... Um, quite useful as an introduction to uh, Stars Without Number because the, it presents an opportunity for the player characters to get their hands on a system ship. And uh, this is important because uh, ships in science fiction games are usually quite expensive. The characters usually have to steal them or, or get them um, through a loan. But here you have an opportunity to uh, hire a pilot and move around uh, the system, explore those space tombs that I will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, those tombs and um, you also uh, have the possibility to perhaps make that pilot a long-term party member or perhaps a hireling so th that's quite uh, useful to to get started with your own ship now let's talk about the sky tombs these sky tombs um, have a sort of like a spiritual purpose they, they will they used to belong to these uh, beings uh, known as the oceans. You have the uh, image right here. They are kind of like um, a plant, uh, half human, half plant beings. And uh, they are somewhat, uh, they are pacifists. They have this uh, belief that they have to bask in the glory of, of the divine race. They are, because they are kind of like plants, they don't need food to survive, they just need uh, light. And 
they do have um, males and females, but their method of reproduction is uh, is quite interesting. They, when an adult ocean dies, that corpse sprouts new uh, ocean babies. You can see this is supposed to be a corpse and there are uh, sprouts coming out of it. And these uh, babies are taken care of by the females of the oceans. Uh, and they created these tombs to, uh, to serve as sort of like uh, sacred rep repositories of the corpses and, and produce life. And uh, again, like, uh, sort of like to get into a spiritual connection with, with the light that gives them life. But you also have the Chitik, and the Chitik are kind of like very hostile, carnivorous, uh, insectoids, uh, have human, have insects. They're kind of like beetle and wasps combined and they enjoy the, the taste of humanoid flesh. So when they met the oceans, they enslaved them, they used them uh, to, to eat and also for, for reproduction because uh, when they reproduce the drones with the uh, females of the Chitik, they need to put those eggs somewhere and they uh, use the oceans, they, they sort of like um, in a parasitic way. So once the eggs uh, hatch within the host body, they eat their way out kind of like aliens from the movies and uh, well the the oceans were kind of used like for everything that was useful for the chitik to uh, and they were using them as food and um, to bring out new chitik but the oceans eventually got rid of their uh, pacifistic notions and decided to fight back but because they didn't train enough and they, they, they are basically not combat effective they got crushed by the Chitik and they committed uh, mass suicide when they uh, saw that victory was not attainable so those tombs uh, became uh, abandoned because normally they would be used uh, for pilgrimages and, and for spiritual purposes but uh, the tombs are just floating there in outer space Most, many of the Chitik also died because they did not have oceans to eat and they don't. They didn't have corpses. Um, uh, well, like living bodies. I think they needed to be alive to implant those eggs. They didn't have uh, those um, hosts to to produce more chitik. Uh, so some of those tombs are completely empty. Some of those tombs uh, still have some oceans within them. Maybe uh, they survived somehow uh, through in a sort of state of stasis. But there are also chitik. So you never know what to expect from those tombs. You do have a couple of detailed and structured tombs in this adventure, but um, you also have a system to generate your own uh, tombs with all the, uh, their random contents. So maybe you could get tombs that have uh, breathing cells, anti-chambers, uh, cold sleep pods, control rooms, dormitories. And the cool thing as well is that Depending on the dynasty, on the period in which a tomb was constructed, uh, you're going to notice differences in the architecture. So, for example, uh, tombs that were constructed, I believe, in the first dynasty, look really geometric. Here's an example of a detailed tomb. You can see it's, it's quite geometric. And that tomb actually is inhabited by space pirates. They arrived at the tomb, maybe they killed uh, any chitik that they found there. And they are quite disrespectful. They even use this uh, sort of like a ritual chamber that houses uh, sort of like a, a crystal coffin of one of the ocean leaders. And they're using the, the coffin as sort of like a gambling table. And they, one of the pirates even stuffed um, a cigar, a cigar in uh, between the lips of the corpse of the high priestess so you can imagine what type of uh, individuals these pirates are and so the player characters have the choice of getting into that tomb and attacking the pirates or maybe dealing with them somewhat diplomatically the choice is up to the player characters and you also have an example of different architecture more organic of a different dynasty let me see if i can get that into focus you can see the map right there i think and that tomb feels more like a, sort of like a giant pantry of sorts because there are many ocean corpses that were frozen because of, um, of um, sort of like a cat catastrophe that happened within that tomb. And so those corpses are not useful uh, as, as food or as um, 
uh, hosts to create new uh, Chitik. But there are some uh, live Chitik in that tomb and the player characters are in for a surprise when they go in there and explore. And you also have another example of a more adv advanced dynasty. This tomb, as you can see, combines um, some geometric designs, but there are also some variations. And that tomb actually contains some live oceans, so if, if player characters deal with them appropriately, they could become allies, uh, help them explore the tombs and fight the Chitik. And these tombs uh, have a lot of valuable things within them. Um, it's worth it to uh, sack them or loot them because uh, there are some... Um, Artifacts like the ocean cutting torches or um, ocean power cells. There's also a very powerful artifact, if I'm not mistaken. It's called the uh, the sky, the sun tower, and it's very powerful. But it also sells for a lot of money, so it's it's up to the player characters if they want to keep that sun tower and use it uh, in their adventures or sell it and perhaps get a better ship later on. So that's quite nice. And then there's a, an event that serves as sort of like an end game scenario, which is called the Judgment Day. And this is when the two factions of the station, uh, that is uh, Lomax's allies and uh, Duta's supporters, clash for control of the station. And if the player characters don't act, uh, things will end up quite unpredictable and chaotic. It's up to the player characters to support uh, one of the factions or perhaps um, pit the two factions uh, into a fight so that the player characters can take control after each of the, the forces involved kills the other or uh, becomes severely wounded. Mm. You also have details on, on the preparations that Lomax was uh, carrying out to get Dota into trouble and some details on how things could get out of hand. Perhaps some, uh, as I was telling you, the systems of the station could get damaged and the station uh, could perhaps maybe separate from the planetoid that is using as a shield from the beast and uh, it's going to melt down um, if the player characters don't evacuate everyone or if they are selfish, if they don't get out of there quickly, the station is going to be destroyed. So there are many ways in which this uh, catastrophic end game scenario uh, can be handled and you have details on the, when the characters arrive at Brightside Station how to get them involved that is a lot of uh, player hooks and you also have um, a lot of details on, on side missions on uh, different side quests related to the non-player characters that the uh, player characters can carry out and even with the description of the non-player characters you have enough information to create a lot of adventures, a lot of side missions. And you also have details on, on how to get the player characters into trouble. So for example, maybe the Tang family has waited long enough and they bring a sort of like um, hired mercenaries or pirates to attack the station and try to, to get uh, Dota killed. Or there are many ways uh, also related with uh, Lomax attempt to take control of the station. And you have all the stats for the different non-player characters and some more generic um, non-player characters such as the uh, um, pirates, uh, security staff, workers, thugs mm. and you also have uh, all the plans of the station with all the information of the different rooms and this is a very cool section, this is uh, the geomorph section and this is a way to randomly uh, create uh, new tombs and that's why I, I was telling you that this has the potential to develop into a short campaign or even a longer campaign. You could use the Brightside Station as a sort of like a hub and have a lot of adventures exploring the tombs, maybe de develop some greater mystery related to the Chetik or the oceans. So you could have an entire adventure just within that system. It's up to you. Or you could handle it as a, a short series of adventures or even just a short uh, scenario. You can handle it any way that you like it. And you have uh, all the technical details on the hard light system. Um, so uh, you, can, you can take this um, system and drop it into your own uh, Stars Without Number campaign. Maybe you're running something already and you just want something to add a bit more meat to your campaign. So let me tell you what I think of hard light. I think this is an amazing adventure because it's not really an adventure, it's also a system to generate tombs 
And it's also, it has the potential to develop as a short campaign or long campaign. I also like the theme. This is not really mm, like a Flash Gordon type of, of adventure. This is more like um, Alien 3 or Riddick. The, the general um, state of affairs within the Brightside Station it feels really uh, gritty and um, hostile at times. Many of the non-player characters are, are quite rugged and, and tough and uh, there aren't too many friendly faces there. You do have uh, some opportunities uh, to get help from non-player characters and to help them in return, but a lot of them have uh, some very selfish agendas. So it, this um, hard light adventure uh, has a lot of ways in which you can get the players involved with the non-player characters to have lots and lots of adventures within the station and outside of the station that is navigating uh, through all those tombs and that is it, and we're not even talking about the uh, interaction between the player characters and the oceans and the chitik there's just a lot of opportunity to uh, add your own style of campaign to this uh, adventure that feels more like a, like a jumping platform to mm, take it as far as you want. Well, thanks for watching my review. If you have any comments or questions, uh, please let me know. Oh, I also forgot to mention that I think it's also quite worth it to um, convert this adventure to other sci-fi systems, not just stars without number. Well, see you later.